This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. This is the start of a mini-series about linear algebra, the study of vectors and matrices. I'm making these videos for two reasons. The first is that linear algebra is the language of quantum mechanics, and so without some of this background I couldn't eventually teach you some topics in my quantum series, like quantum computing for example. The second is, this topic is so geometrical and beautiful, and yet the way it's sometimes taught in university and high school, students don't seem to take away a lot of intuition about it. I'm hoping these videos might show you linear algebra from a slightly different perspective than you might have seen before. This is the perspective that made it first click for me, so I hope it might work for some of you too. And if not, don't worry, at the end of the video I'll point you to some other resources that I really like that could help instead. Anyway, let's start with vectors. We'll see later that lots of different things count as vectors, but for now we're going to think of them very concretely. Vectors are arrows, with some fixed direction and some length. I'm going to tell you a way of thinking of vectors that sounds really silly, but I found very helpful at the start. Let's think of them as arrows that tell you where to go. A vector says, if you start here, you need to go this much in this direction. Basically, if you put the dull side of the vector where you start, you end up on the pointy side. Thinking of vectors this way makes it really easy to add vectors. When you're introduced to them, you might think, if a vector is 3 units long and another vector is 2 units long, if you add them, you get something that's 5 units long. But that's not necessarily true, and you can see why if you think of them this way. When you add two vectors, what you're really saying is, if I go the direction the first vector told me to, and then from that endpoint go the direction the second vector wanted me to go, in total how far did I get from the start and in what direction? So in this example, the vector representing the overall path is this, and so this is the sum of these two vectors. By the way, notice if you'd followed this vector first and then this one, you'd still end up in the same spot so the order doesn't matter at all when you're adding vectors. But something that does matter is the direction. You can't rotate these vectors around when you add them. To see if you understand all of this so far, here's a quick question. Imagine you add these two vectors. What's the sum of them? Here are your options and pause the video to think about it, and when you're ready, you can vote for your answer in the poll in the corner here. Okay, so to answer this, you need to move the vector over here. But, if you put the vector this way, then you'd be following this vector in the opposite direction than what it wants you to go. Instead, you need the vector like this, and then you end up almost back the way you came, but not quite. So this is your resulting vector. Anyway, now that we understand how to add two vectors, we understand how to add as many as we like. Just keep following directions. Good. But adding together isn't all that vectors can do. They can also get multiplied by a number. And there's a simple way to think of this too. This just stretches or squeezes the length of the vector without changing the direction. But what happens when you multiply it by negative 1, for example? It just flips the vector in the opposite direction. And negative a third, for example, that just flips its direction, then squishes it by a third. Before we move on to the really interesting stuff, a quick word about notation. I'll write a general vector like this with a little arrow on top. This is fairly common notation, but there's lots of different ways people use. In fact, in quantum mechanics we use a notation that you've already seen if you watch my videos, and it's like this. Anyway, say you have some vectors. Now you know you can add them together and you can also multiply each by a number that squishes it or stretches it. But the most general thing that you can do is both. Multiply each of the vectors by something and then add them together. 
This is called a linear combination of vectors, and it's the most general way that you can make a new vector from a bunch of ones that you already have. Now, a question you might be asking yourself is, exactly which other vectors can I make from a given set of vectors? For example, if I gave you these two vectors, can you end up with any other vector on the plane by taking a linear combination? How about see if you can make this vector? On a piece of paper, draw something like this. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly the same. And then see if by stretching and squeezing and flipping the original vectors and then adding them together, you can make this third vector. I think the best way to understand vectors is actually play around with them. So seriously, pause the video, pick up a scrap of paper and try it. And if you think you know how to do it, try it with another example as well. Assuming that you gave that a go, here's how to do it for any example. Draw a grid like this with your two vectors. This says you need to go two of these lengths to get here and minus 1.5 to get here. So in my case, the new vector is minus 1.5 v1 plus 2 v2. Using this method, you can take a linear combination of two vectors to get any other vector on the plane. Well, not quite. There's one special case. Imagine if I'd given you two vectors that are on the same line. One of them is just a multiple of the other. So when you do a linear combination of them, you're really just getting a multiple of one of them. The other one is redundant. If we look at all the vectors that you can make from these vectors, which is called the span of these vectors, it's just anything on this line. But let's see what happens when we think of the 3D case. How many vectors do you need so that a linear combination of them will get you every possible vector in 3D space? Clearly two vectors is not enough. Any two vectors only gets you vectors on the plane that they span. So you need a third vector. But what if the third vector was on that same plane? Then clearly it's also redundant. Think of it this way, you can write the third vector as a combination of the other two. So when you have a linear combination of all three vectors, you can just rewrite it as a linear combination of just the two vectors instead. And so the third vector didn't get you anywhere. On the other hand, if your third vector is not in the plane, you can get a vector anywhere in 3D. You can convince yourself of that by using a similar grid argument to the 2D case. Now, if you've understood everything so far, you've understood one of the most important ideas in linear algebra, and that's the idea of a basis. We saw in our examples that a line can be spanned by just one vector, a plane can be spanned by two, and 3D space can be spanned by three vectors, but only if you don't have any redundancies. Imagine that you have vectors v1 to vn spanning some space. A vector, say, vi is redundant if, when you take that vector out, you still get the same space. That happens when that vector can be written as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. As long as none of the vectors are dependent on the other vectors like this, then we have the minimum number of vectors to span that space. If you deleted any, you'd get a smaller space. Then this set of vectors is called a basis for the space. Obviously, for any space of vectors, there are many different choices of basis. For example, both of these bases work for the plane, and so it's not unique. But there are two reasons why they're still very important. Firstly, for any vector space, the number of basis elements is fixed. It's called the dimension of the space. The second is, if you pick a basis and you write another vector in that space as a linear combination of these basis elements, there's only one correct way to do it. I.e., you couldn't write that V is also equal to this other linear combination. 
It's not hard to prove these two statements and I think it's really good practice for you to try. So I'd like you to have a go at it and write your solutions in the comments. Now, finally, I want to explain the link between what I've said so far and what you might have seen about vectors before. You might have seen vectors written as a column of numbers like this. I think a lot of students misunderstand what this means. A vector isn't really a column of numbers. This is a shorthand. What it means is that there's some basis that you have for your vectors already fixed. Then this vector is a times the first basis vector plus b times the second basis vector, etc. It's a shorthand for writing out this whole sum and it's very convenient. But I really hope that if I taught you nothing else, a vector is not a stack of numbers. They're arrows with directions and you can only write them as a column of numbers once you've established what the basis is. Before you go, I encourage you to try the following two multiple choice questions. I strongly believe that linear algebra is just one of those topics you can't understand without getting your hands dirty. Even if you thought everything in this video was very straightforward, there's lots of tricky questions that can help you understand the subtleties. Here are two that on the surface seem really simple and the calculation would only take you a minute, but you need to think a bit carefully. So here are the questions and you can find both of them in the description as well. The first question is about redundancy. The question is, one of these three vectors is redundant. Which one is it? Once you've had a think, put your answers in the poll here. The second question is about which of these vector spaces contains the others. Again, you can put your answers in the poll in the corner here. I'd be really interested to see what you guys thought. As you may have noticed, these two questions are from Brilliant.org, who are sponsoring this series. Brilliant have a course on linear algebra, which I think will complement this series perfectly because they introduce the subject from a different angle by looking at systems of linear equations. I've never seen that approach done as well as their website does it, and I think the reason it works so well is because they don't just tell you the concepts, they ask you questions which make you engage with the material. If you watch my channel, you know that I set homework at the end of my videos for the exact same reason. You can't learn without thinking about the material on your own. The questions are brilliant are at a perfect level to keep you on your toes and to illustrate the concepts in a very tangible way. Despite the fact that I do research in a field that is basically applied linear algebra, I got a lot from going through this course, so I can personally recommend it. I really wanted all of you to have the chance to do the part of their linear algebra course relevant to this video, so they've kindly made that free for the next two weeks. If you like their stuff, you can get a 20% off their annual membership by following the link in the description and on the screen. My next video will be up here soon, where we'll learn about matrices. Meanwhile, I really recommend a video series by 3Blue1Brown on linear algebra especially if you'd like to go deeper in this topic.